Welcome to STEM Pumps. STEM Pumps is a bi monthly podcast intended to bring science, technology, engineering, engineering straight to your ears from our STEM Punk studio. Hang on, we'll take you for a ride that includes a whole lot of fun and a little bit of education on the side. Stay tuned. Nice to be in orbit. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the STEM Punks podcast. My name is Joe Garut, and I will be your host. And of course, since I can't do it alone, I have my digital buddy, Stembot, here. Hello, Stembot. Hello, Joe. Stembot, as you know, I've been wanting to talk about putting the A for art in STEM for quite a while. As a theater graduate, I was really grateful for my training as I went into various work-life scenarios. Even my skeptical father had to admit that theater training served me well as I managed and owned different businesses. My interpersonal skills with the public was definitely helped by being on that stage. And that has been on my mind as we dive into STEM and I think about how best to communicate STEM ideas. Today's educators have the same challenge. How best to get students to not only digest the information they need, but how might they get them excited about it? Maybe it's best to start out with some definitions, Joe. Should we clarify what STEM is? I think most people tuning in know what stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Yes, but that piece I shared with you from the Huffington Post about STEM education says it really well. That's true, STEMbot. Will you pull that up for me to read? Change tabs on your screen, Joe. It's on the right. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Ah, here it is. But what exactly is STEM education? It's much more than science, technology, engineering, and math, which are usually taught as discrete subjects with math down one hallway in school and science down another. Rather, STEM is the applied, integrated approach to those subjects. It is about using math and science to solve real-world challenges and problems. This applied, project-based way of teaching and learning allows students to understand and appreciate the relevancy of their work to the world around them. Arguably, STEM is at the core of everything. Boy, you're spot on, STEMbot. That is a great quote. Thank you. Should I pull up the definition of art? Oh, no, I don't think we have enough time in this episode to answer the quintessential question, what is art? Everyone has an opinion about that. But I do think that we could say that, most commonly, arts education refers to education in the disciplines of music, dance, theater, and visual arts. You know, what is really interesting to share is that the arts develop neural networks in the brain that positively affect fine motor skills, creativity, and improved emotional balance. In a study conducted by Judith Burton at Columbia University, research showed that subjects such as math, science, and language require complex cognitive and creative capacities typical of arts learning. The arts enhance the process. The systems they nourish are the driving forces behind all other learning, sensory, attentional, cognitive, emotional, and motor capacity. There are some who would say that adding art into STEM education would distract the students from what they need to be learning. I would argue that rather than that, it would enhance the lessons that they teach. The Integrated Arts Academy in Burlington, Vermont, uses music, dance, movement, theater, and visual arts to help children learn core subjects. They strive to inspire young minds by nurturing the imagination and engaging the whole child to achieve academic excellence through the arts. It was started as an effort to break up socioeconomic imbalances. Now, before IAA became an arts-integrated magnet school, only 17% of its third graders were proficient in math on the NECAP test, the NECAP test, which is the acronym for the New England Common Assessment Program. It is a series of reading, writing, mathematics, and science achievement tests administered annually, which were developed in response to the federal No Child Left Behind Act. After five years, 66% met and achieved the standards. That's a big jump. 
Also very interesting is that referrals to the office are almost non-existent during arts integration periods, and students and their families are more engaged with the school. So maybe if they would have integrated arts when you were in grade school, you wouldn't have been sent to the principal's office so much. <laughs> hey there, easy now. That was easy. It was an interpolation of data that led me to a hypothesis. Unfortunately, we cannot study the impact such a change would have. You are far too old now. Uh, yeah. Grade school was a few minutes ago. Joe, it was approximately 22,089,866.4 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, approximately. Okay, all right, so, moving on. I have two guests today, and they had so much to say that I had to include mere excerpts of the interviews in the interest of time. Both are artists, but my first guest is also a teacher, and both shared with me their interesting ways of viewing the blurred line between art and the rest of life. You'll notice in the first interview that Rose has a little helper in the background. <laughs> Man, he was worth his own show, but I'll save that for another time as well. Stembot, will you call up that interview? Already on it, Joe. I'd like to introduce Rose Melhoff. She resides in Portland, Oregon. Rose, will you please start by telling us a bit about yourself? Yes. Right now, I am a teacher of high school students. The subject is English. I'm also a mama of a four-year-old, and his name is Carter. And uh, the recipe that has brought me to this moment is a background with the arts, painting on canvas, art therapy, in which I get others to find their own way through expression, and then a conversation with sciences through uh, sometimes domestic means, like the cooking and the baking with the chemistry and understanding the conversation that takes place between different ingredients and how they interact, but also some other projects like understanding and executing the building of a small engine. So it sounds like the A belongs in STEM, making it STEAM for you. Indeed. Yes, the A was the entry. Oh, that's great. That's great. So um, how long have you been um, doing this, integrating the two? Mm. Good question. <laughs> uh, probably since childhood with different projects with my family, like planting an orchard and understanding that in the soil, some trees would grow and thrive, even without much attention, and others would just dwindle. Then bringing to fruition the trees through uh, harvesting the fruit and making cider out of the apples. Ah, so, so the cider was the art in this equation. I think so. I think so. But also, you know, there's a cider press and, and looking at the working parts. So what I'm saying is by paying attention to all the parts of a process, it seems there's always some kind of art involved where there's a creative capacity needed. But we need to know how things work through more of the science and the engineering at times to get there. That would even be true of color blending, wouldn't it? You'd have to understand your paints a little bit in order to know how to blend those colors and, and what would be proper additions to get the, the end result that you were looking for on a canvas as an artist. That's true, and we could go about it with just the A for art by feeling into how those colors speak to each other, but we could also use the science of color theory and get an intellectual understanding of those colors too. And then there is actually more opportunity in the painting when we make use of more than one modality. So the arts and the science give a greater yield than just one because we become more informed. And how does technology fit into all this? There is a, a theorist, Walter Benjamin, I believe his name is, and he would say that if the artwork is not original, it loses its aura. And so I take those words to mean when we encounter an original work of art, there is something that we feel on a soul level, if you will, or if soul isn't part of your vocabulary, how about your bones? You feel the message of the art. 
part of what I heard in my head was that original artwork has a vibrational energy within it. You said if it's soul, that's fine. If that's not your vocabulary, then it's something else. And so that's when it occurred to me that vibration may be coming off of that, a vibration stored from the originator that then resonates to everybody who views it afterwards. I agree. That is well said. Art is a transformational process where one must step into the field of the unknown and see what can be built. And it's not a straight shot. It's a circuitous exploration that takes some grit and tenacity and grace to keep seeing the process all the way through. That was just a snippet of my interview with Rose Melhoff. There was a lot of great info in there, and I could do a whole episode on her, and maybe we will revisit some of the other things she had to say. Her last statement really struck me that kind of the same thing happens for scientists. They can't always take a straight shot to a result. It's often something of a circuitous route that brings them to an epiphany or an idea that is unique and different than the place that they may have begun. You know, studies have shown that allowing time to let the mind wander is helpful in the creative process. I think that applies to both artists and scientists and, well, all of us. I have another snippet here that is from my interview with Eric Lindsay. Eric was my guest for Episode 7. We talked about the many calendars in use in the world today. It was fascinating. As an artist, he too had so many great things to say that I want to bring in a piece of that interview here. Stembot, will you please help me out with that? Here you go, Joe. Everything is art. Really, it can be. Our meal can be art. The way we live our day can be art because it's just choosing different elements and putting them together in a way that feels good. And you've pointed That's out to me the, uh, the art in nature. I think that one of the most interesting things that you mentioned was how if we look at things, uh, the natural spirals that occur within different plants and animals. Okay, well, everything in nature has spirals in it. Um, You can look at a nautilus shell and you see the spiral. You look at a spiral galaxy and look at uh, the face of a sunflower and there's a spiral in there. Our DNA is a spiral. So it's a a mathematical equation in nature. There's the the Fibonacci uh, sequence, right? Fibonacci sequence, yeah. Yeah. There's the golden golden mean. Yeah, it's interesting that the Fibonacci sequence is something that we had to give a name to. It's a spiral that someone saw and at some point a mathematician put together that it was mathematically explainable. Now there's a part of human nature that likes to have explanations and so the math sequence was applied to something that occurs naturally and is beautiful. But it's just interesting how we at times aren't satisfied with just accepting that something is what it is. The beauty in it wasn't enough. We had to explain it through math. But STEM gives us that. The the math could explain the art. The art was there, the natural art. But we right. applied some right. math. There's a lot of artists that use um, geometry. It's incredible what they can come up with. That da Vinci drawing is called the Vitruvian Man. Right. And so that's all based on this spiral all the proportions of our a whole, whole body. In fact, you can find diagrams of that online where it'll show the different ratios of the human body. I remember That's that from actually from a, a, a theater. Here's, here's art. Here's art going in with math. I remember when I was uh, in theater and taking a costuming class and we were uh, learning to draw the human body for costuming purposes. I remember that there were portions. The size of a segment between the knee and the ankle was a a proportion of the thigh, was a proportion of the size of the torso, was a proportion of... Right, right. Something called the platonic solids, which are geometric shapes. And they're starting to use geometric shapes in building because they find that the structures are much stronger using these natural formations. You know, you're also a musician. Do you have anything that you've come across that you'd like to share with us about math and music? Well, I'm, I've always had a difficulty with math. That makes two of us, But I have good rhythm, right. so I, I play uh, you know, hand drum or an uh, instrument called the uh, hand pan, which is a steel drum. It's con, it's con convex instead of concave. Correct. And then it uh, has this deep resonance of vibration. I really enjoy the vibration. I was a massage therapist also, and that kind of keyed me into how vibration can be used in the body to help elicit a calm, relaxed, responsive state. 
And that's that all a matter of waves that are vibrating a certain number of times per second, which we can calculate mm -hmm. through math. So there, right there is a perfect example of how art or music and math go together. And the science yeah, of it I, is is that biologically we end up feeling better. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's like going out into the forest because the forest is resonating a certain frequency that is the um, frequency of well-being. Well, and yeah. I think the best part about it is is that you don't feel the need to have it explained in order for it to work. You allow it to work. And through right. your use right. of these items, you've come to this peace and this knowledge and so you almost work together oh for sure for sure a lot of times i listen to what the material wants to be you know i mean that's a big part of it is uh, feeling feeling where the metal wants to go how it wants to go and then incorporating my style and so it's, yeah, it's kind of like a back and forth boy a really big thank you to both my guests rose melhoff and eric Lindsay, both with really great thought-provoking things to say you know as I record this, which of course is my blending of technology, education, and art, I think always of whether the message I intend is received. I wonder if there will be discussion and change, if the audio vibrations from my voice through the electronics via the internet or cell towers, through your electronics to whatever speakers you have or headphones, which converts electricity back into audio waves, which vibrate the tympanic membranes in your ears, which send signals to your brain, will carry the heartfelt intent that I'm sending. Well, I may or may not ever know, but the beauty is I have created it nonetheless. I have made my bit of art much like a visual artist and left it to hang out there for the public to interact with. Much like the sun doesn't know if we've felt its rays, I may never know if you feel mine, but hopefully my integration of science, technology, education, art, and math has engaged you enough for you to learn something or approach something in a new way. That's all for us for this time. Say goodbye, Stembot. Goodbye, Stembot. The Stempunks podcast was recorded this time not only in a special padded room in White Salmon, Washington, but also partly at Sasquatch Studios in Bingen, Washington. Their padded room is better than ours. Thanks, Jason, for letting us get in there when you're not on the mic. This week's show was sponsored by Cottywomple Creative. Making art may be a circuitous journey, but Cottywomple Creative has the tenacity and grit to see it through to something beautiful. You can see their work or contact them for a custom piece at CottywompleCreative.com. We are also brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. The number of supporters is steadily growing, and we appreciate you all so much. Without you, we'd be hard-pressed to make these shows. You, too, can become a patron for just a dollar a month at our Patreon website. See the link in the show notes. This time, we want to finish by giving a shout-out to Big Britches Productions. Their show, The Odd Couple, the female version modified from the original by the playwright himself, Neil Simon, opened this weekend, February 8th, 2019, and runs until February 23rd. Tickets are available at bigbritches.org. And I'm telling you, folks, you want to go and have a good laugh at this show. It's great. 